We are ready. Um, good morning, everyone. What a beautiful day to study, huh? Every day is good to study. Uh, I want to start with uh, a very strange text that not, doesn't have to do anything with uh, Ruth or Naomi. Uh, I wanted to open to the play, the, the page, that has Hebrew on the top and English on the bottom. Because maybe it's time for us to understand this. Uh, we're not going to go over the Hebrew. Anyone, I mean, we can do it. But we'll just look at the translation. So this is uh, very early in the book of uh, Genesis. Uh, it's, I'm sure you read it many times, but it's about Lot um, and about what happens after Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened to those two cities? They were zapped. They were gone. They were Las Vegas uh, of, of the old days. If you wanted to have good time, you go to Sodom and Gomorrah uh, because they were very cruel, strange uh, people there. Um, and I'm sure some gambling. But anyway, uh, there is something very strange that is happening uh, at verse 30 on the bottom of the page. Who would like to read uh, verse 30 in the middle of the page? Well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to listen to your complaints. <laughs> Lot went up from Zoar and settled in the hill country with his two daughters. Okay, so the wife has died already. She, she is a pillar. By the way, when you go to Israel, I'll tell you exactly where to find her. Uh, every rock in the southern part of Israel looks like her. So, uh, go on. Okay, so that's their life. Living in a cave, everything was destroyed. Uh, go on. And the older one said to the younger, Our father is old, and there's not a man on earth to consort with us in the way of all the world. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and let's lie with him, that we may make a life through our father. So, what in the hell? <laughs> what is going on here? Why is this story here? And how is this connected to Ruth? You'll see in a second. Okay, so, uh, I mean, they were absolutely astonished after the destruction, and they think there's no one else in the world. Go on. That night they made their father drink wine, and the older one went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she rose. The next day the older one said to the younger, See, I lay with father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go and lie with him, that we may maintain life through our father. By the way, uh, would you blame them? I think it's very creative on their part. Uh, thinking that the world is destroyed. I mean, yeah, uh, don't judge him yet. Go on. That night also they made their father drink wine, and the younger one went and lay with him. He did not know when she lay down and when she rose. Thus the two daughters of Lot came to be with the child by their father. The older one bore a son named Ben Ami. What this has to do with Ruth? Okay, so look at what happened through the biblical writer. So early in Genesis, we already know what about the Moabites and the Ammonites. What do we know? Incest. Incest. Hey, you want to make sure that you don't mingle with Moabites and Ammonites? Put some kind of a stain in the way they were conceived by creating the incest story, which is brilliant, because we know it never happened. I mean, who cares? Are you guys very upset to discover that there are things in the Bible that never happened? <laughs> I think it's... I think we need to understand the mind of the biblical author of that paragraph. So there was a time when the Israelites were forbidden to marry Moabites and Ammonites, and uh, forbidden even to eat with them or drink with them because they were 
those Gentiles that had different kind of way of worshiping. So in Genesis, in the beginning already, you get, in a way, the marching order of what kind of a Jew or Israelite you're going to be. So what's going on with Ruth? The book of Ruth was written to open the door for the possibility of what? In the merit, a possibility of uh, maybe it's time to reconcile with the Moabites and the Ammonites, and maybe what was written in Genesis needs, of course, to develop. We're living in different times, and maybe now is the time to to get together and figure out how we're living our lives together. By the way, in the book of Ruth, you will not find even one ounce of a conversion class. There's nothing about conversion. Of course, the Jewish commentary will be that Ruth studied a lot about Judaism. How can you expect the grand great mother of King David? So the Moabite, she is there in the book just to make the connection to King David, which all of our religions support. I mean, the Messiah is coming from King David. So can you see the change that took from Genesis and treating the Moabites and the Ammonites as what? Despised nations, to all the way to the book of Ruth that actually give legitimization that you can be a Moabite and still be the great-grandmother of King David who will announce the Messiah. Where is the book that in place? The book should actually be in the book of Judges. That story belongs to Judges. But this is a lot later. It's part of the five scrolls. There are five scrolls in Jewish tradition in a, that are written on a scroll and not in a book. So we have the Torah. The Torah you, of course, saw many times. We take it out of the ark and we open it. It's written on a scroll. The other five pieces of literature that are written only on scrolls are those five books. What are the five books? Yeah. Esther. What else? The Book of Ruth, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, and Lamentation. So we have five books in the Bible that traditionally are written on a scroll. Each of those books is read in a different Jewish holiday. So those five scrolls are parallel to five holidays. Let me give you the information how this works. So Ecclesiastes, how many of you read the book? By the way, I think it's one of the most sweet and mind-boggling uh, book. We read this in the holiday of Sukkot, in the holiday of the uh, booth. Uh, that's the holiday. Usually it's in the fall. Uh, what's the book all about? The book is about what? Change of seasons. Everything is vanity. Vanity, vanity of vanity. Yeah. Uh, Ecclesiastes. It talks about the fact that it doesn't make sense to be alive because at the end someone else will inherit everything you worked so hard uh, to have. Basically I gave you one line of a deeper book, but I mean, at this moment. So this is read in the season of rain when you come out of the holiday of Day of Atonement and you build a booth to dwell there for seven days if you are a liberal Jew and for eight days if you are Orthodox Jew. Huh, let's not go there. <laughs> That's for another time. Uh, and the idea is that you are leaving your comfort you leave your home, the sturdy home you have, and you are willing to live in God's nature outside for seven or eight days. Life is a transient, and that's why we read the book of Ecclesiastes. Because maybe everything is vanity or maybe not. The book of Esther, we know when we're reading it. When? Purim. Okay. Uh, the book of Song of Songs. The book of Song of Songs, we... Uh, Huge part of the Song of Songs is sung and worshipped on Friday night. The Book of Ruth is written is being read when? 
Ruth becomes the paradigm of the person that comes in from a different religion, the Mohavites. We read this on Shavuot, the day of the receiving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. In the most important, oh, I'm not repeating everything again. No, no, no. Oh, it's I didn't know battery. you. Had... It's on battery right now. I'm just going to oh, plug it. I didn't know you were looking for this. Go ahead. Uh, so it's such a wonderful place to read the book of Ruth because the, Ruth gave us the key words for conversion. What is the famous speech of Ruth in the book? Whatever you go. Yeah. Maybe traditionally the only way you needed to convert to Judaism was to say this. So those are the words. And by the way, the convert that converts receives the name in Hebrew, Ruth, the daughter of Abraham and Sarah. So part of the conversion is reciting exactly the sentences from the book of Ruth. And so why we read this on Shavuot, on the day when we receive the Torah, because in a way, what? We we're all there on the bottom of the mountain saying exactly what she said. And we'll go over the text. Uh, what was the other book I mentioned? The scroll? Lamentation. Lamentation, of course. It's coming soon. And it's Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, the date that the destruction of the first and second temple took place. So we have a holiday called the ninth of Av. So the, the the Jewish month are in Hebrew. So Av is coming very soon. And that day we sit, lament, read the book of Lamentations. And by the way, uh, Jews are so creative. We put all the disasters that took place in our history on the same day. So the crystal, crystal Nach started on that day. Not really. But why not, I mean, if you want to be miserable, why not to put all the misery for one day? And you're done with this. Get it out. Get it over. The summer is here. Who puts a sad holiday in the middle of the summer? Only Jews. And by the way, the practice of this is whining because we don't really care anymore about the destruction. I think the best thing that happened to Judaism is a destruction of the temple. Because it created a whole different Judaism as a result of it. A rabbinic Judaism. Uh, I will, of course, be careful in saying this in, in front of my Orthodox friends. They lament the destruction of the, of the temple. They cry about this. Uh, I, think, I think it's wonderful that we have so many variations of Judaism that we constantly listen to each other, hopefully, and we study and we learn. Uh, I don't want to be part of the Bible people. By the way, when I go and teach in UNO, some of the people that come to my class never met a Jew before. So they know, uh, and I, I think what we are doing now, it's, it's good because you will have a lot more information. I mean, Judaism is more than just the five books of Moses. It's everything else that since then including those books that you showed me this morning. I mean, so we have so many books. And so it's, it's interesting with those students. What? You have more than five? Yeah, we have a lot more than five. Yeah. So there were no rabbis before the temple? Before the temple, it was the priestly cult. You had the sacrifices. Uh, do you want to go back to that world? Well, it's enough July 4th. We do shish kebab. And I mean, I, can, I cannot see ourselves doing this anymore. By the way, we used to have sisterhood tea at Temple Israel, where we invited women to come. And from time to time, I'll get someone raising hand and say, so where are you guys doing your sacrifices? <laughs> no, 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 I mean, it's OK. I mean, the, people don't understand that Judaism of today is not the biblical Judaism. By the way, Christianity of today is not the Jesus Christianity. I mean, what? Unfortunately? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's good what's happening to all of us. And we are growing up. We're trying to figure out 
2017, how I can express my Christianity to the best of my ability. And I think this church is doing a fantastic job about it. I, I don't want Moses to suddenly be resurrected and, and come see what I'm doing. Oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, I started with this. It has nothing to do with the Book of Ruth, but I wanted to make sure that I create a bridge between what was the view of early writers in the Bible versus what happened of having a book written about Ruth the Moabite. Similar to what I said to you last time about the Torah portion named Jethro that comes and tells about the Ten Commandments. Jethro was a Midianite. The same relationship Jews had, Israelites, had with the Moabites and the Ammonites, the head with the Midianites. But so, who is Moses? Moses is married to the daughter of a Midianite priest. So there was interfaith marriages all through life. Okay, so now we are ready for the Book of Ruth. So uh, please open the text. We're not going to read everything, but it's very important that you read this uh, before Sunday sermon. Uh, anyone can summarize it in a few words? Naomi's husband and her sons died, and she and her daughters-in-law yeah. are alone and not supported, go back to Bethlehem. Yeah, so Naomi lives with her husband and uh, two sons in the land of Israel because of drought, because of different conditions, they migrate. And of course, the two sons, so why are they dying? First of all, there is a hint here uh, through their names. Uh, the two names of the two sons are Mahalon and Kilayon. Do you know what that mean? The names mean? That's that's the loss of Hebrew. So can can you please tell us what the meaning is? Because you already mentioned it. Sickness and spent. Yeah. Who is going to give their kids the names of sickness and destruction? But part of it is the punishment that they left the land of Israel. Didn't stay there. Didn't trust God's ability to provide to the Israelites living in Bethlehem. So they go and they die. So they married women that are Moabites. Okay? So uh, they come back. She wants, Naomi wants to go back. Naomi, by the way, means pleasant. So the names have deep meaning. Orpa, she has two daughters in law. Orpa is a stiff neck. <laughs> because what happened with Orpa? She stayed. She did not understand the gift that Ruth was giving Naomi and the relationship between the two women. And so that's, that's why Ruth is the name that most converts that are women will take upon themselves because of the love and the attention to Naomi. Anyway, they die and she goes back. Of course, she goes back. And the women of the village where she was uh, living in uh, uh, saw how uh, sad she is, and she said to the women, uh, don't call me Naomi, don't call me pleasant, call me Mara, which means bitterness. Mara, uh, which is interesting, Miriam in the Bible. What is the role of Miriam, the prophetess in the book of Exodus? What's her job? Miriam is the one that is the singer. What else she does? When she died, there was no more water for the Israelites. So which is interesting. Also from the same root of Mara bitterness because she had the ability of turning bitter water into sweet water. On Passover, we Jews, being creative, have a glass now. It's called the glass or the cup of Miriam. And we have just pure water in that glass to symbolize the role of Miriam in the redemption story. 
We also, uh, that's why, uh, that's why I'm not, um, I'm not so much interested in how Passover was celebrated in ancient time, because now we have an orange on the plate, Passover Seder, to represent gay, lesbian, trans transgender. Uh, I, think, I think the religion dies when creativity dies, when you're not trying to create symbols and rituals that are fitting our time, here and now. So I don't, I don't lament not having Moses now. I'm actually happy that he's not here. Yeah, but it's, it brings energy. It creates an animosity. An animosity is a wonderful way to be creative. Competition. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, but I think, I think rituals are... It, the question is, so how do you effectuate this love to God? I mean, you said it so beautifully. But how do you prove it? How do you do it? How do you... Uh, I love my husband. What is the meaning of that? So you need to have the rituals. You need to have those pieces that help us really confirm to that greater belief. Uh, I'll leave it there. It's OK. We can, we can talk one day about this. Uh, OK, so now they come to Bethlehem. And the last line of this chapter is, uh, they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley season. Uh, so now. They come to chapter 2, uh, they come there, and uh, what is Naomi saying to her daughters? No, 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 not yet, but she tells them they are from Moab. So they, they were like, uh, in the chapter 1, she wants them to stay in Moab. They don't have to come with, with her. And then, of course, this is when Ruth says, do not press me to leave you or to turn back, that chapter one, sorry, from follow me, wherever you go, I will go, wherever you lodge, I will lodge, your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Actually, and then she comes where you die, I will die, and I will be buried in the same place. Actually, maybe that's what is needed for conversion. Maybe that sentence is enough. Uh, we discover that it's not enough because you need to learn what Judaism is. So we have classes that work. Uh, but it's such a simple password to enter into the religion. So for the rabbis of the Talmud, this was enough. They didn't have to talk about classes of conversion, although they had a problem with King Solomon. What's the problem with King Solomon? How many women King Solomon was married to? 1,000, according to tradition, because the way he expanded his kingdom was to marry the daughters of all the kings around. And so according to tradition, at night, he did not sleep with them. He had classes of conversion. Come on. <laughs> oh. So the Jewish tradition brings a lot of question if you're reading it word by word as if it Happened. So the rabbis of the Talmud had to come out and tell us this is what really happened, you know, part of the interpretation. Uh, by the way, uh, here is the next secret that you need to know. The grand-grandchildren of Ruth and Orpah met in a battle. Try to guess who is the grand-grandchild of Orpah. Goliath. So the Orpah and Ruth conflict continued. So there wasn't just the last name, a uh, stiff neck woman, but those two great grandchildren had to meet again and for the David to defeat the son of Orpah or the grand grandson of Orpah. It's fascinating. It's, it's not in a Bible, it's in a Midrash. 
and also it is in the Apocrypha, uh, which you know by now what it is. Okay, so Boaz, Boaz is a, a new name, Boaz. Boaz means strength in him. Bo, in, Az, Oz, the wizard of Oz. It's about, yeah, it's a Jewish tale, guys. <laughs> oh my God, of course. Uh, who is behind the cur curtain? Come on. <laughs> it was invented by Jews. Uh, the Wizard of Oz. Uh, anyway, uh, so Boaz has fields. He's very wealthy. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Ruth comes. Uh, to try to get some barley, uh, and uh, uh, he uh, recognized that she is actually related. They have some family connections, uh, and he asked uh, in the next page, he asked the people who work in the fields to make sure she is treated well. He invites her to stay in the field and continue to glean, uh, and he's really impressed, not only from her beauty, but the way, the way she is gleaning. Uh, and, and the way she's not taking too much. Uh, and he offers her food, offers uh, uh, her to drink. And she comes home and tells her mother-in-law about this amazing hospitality of how Boaz treated her. Now, the mother-in-law, Naomi, uh, has a plan. What is the plan? They'll be nice if the two get together. And so she, she tells her daughter-in-law to do something that I'm sure women, mothers here, will never tell their daughters to do. <laughs> Go there, eat, wait till he sleeps from the too much wine he drank, and then just go and sleep next to his feet. Make sure you pick up whatever dress or coat he had, and just wait and see what happens. So <laughs> this is a huge struggle uh, for the commentary. What exactly happened? I mean, this is like, uh, was there intercourse that night? What exactly happened? So you will see they kept it out of the Bible, but I brought you an apocrypha piece about the marriage of Boaz to Ruth. In the Apocrypha, there is no fear, intercourse completely. It didn't make it to the Jewish Bible, but it's there. That's why it's so interesting sometimes. The story is absolutely par parallel to the story of the Book of Ruth. We'll go over this. The only thing difference is the intercourse. The Bible did not feel, the writers didn't want this kind of a conniving way to get his love to Ruth. They wanted to keep it natural. So they cleaned that word. Uh, so uh, actually it works. Look at, um, uh, look at um, he, uh, the bottom of uh, chapter three is again about the generosity. And now comes uh, chapter four. Maybe we can, uh, They discover that there is, in biblical time, uh, the person that is closer in lineage, a kin, they discover that there is a, someone that has the first right to refuse. So if, if uh, Naomi came back with her daughters-in-law, someone in the family of Naomi had to do what with Ruth? So he's closer in lineage to Naomi. He has the right to do what? What do you, what do you, what do you have to do? What? No, not find a land. He needs to marry her, the person, the person that is closest, the obligation. It's a, it's a, by the way, these cases take place still in Israel today in a, or in other places where there is a rabbinic court. So the rule, biblical rule, is still staying until today, which is if I am related to her and she loses her husband, 
if, if I'm married, of course, I can't do it, but if I'm single, I need to marry her to perpetuate the seed of the family. So, for example, and there's a ritual uh, that is called a shoe ritual, and it's in this story, where uh, I give a shoe and I keep my commitment, commitment to that. But if I don't want to do it and I'm married and I have kids, uh, I take the shoe back. It's just a ritual in biblical times. So today, for example, we have men that died in Israel's wars. And they were not able to have children. The obligation is on the brother of the brother or the brothers of that man to refuse or to marry. Until today, the younger brother who is maybe not married yet has the obligation to marry the widow, to keep the family name in the tribe, in a way. And a what? There's a Hallmark movie a couple of years ago with that. Yeah, 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 of course. They are, they are the one really trying to observe it. Uh, but there is a, also the right on the part of the brother, if he is married, not to marry. It's one wife only. I mean, so. Uh, but sometimes the, the movie was about, I, I remember the movie, the movie was about the woman waiting for the child to grow up. So there was a period of her waiting for him to become of mature age to be able to marry him. And it's, it's very complicated. But this is what happens here uh, in the story. Boaz, uh, who would like to read the chapter four because it's an important piece to remember. Anyone? Chapter, yeah, please. No sooner had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there than the next of kin, of whom Boaz had spoken, came passing by. Yeah, so I've, uh, where, you, where you do your uh, dealing, legal dealing, you do it at the gate. Uh, at the gate there are elderly sages sitting and the king, uh, the king, boss, so boss said to him what? So boss said, come over, friend, sit down here. And he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. He then said to the next of kin, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman. Eli Melech. That was the husband of Naomi, Eli Melech. Eli Melech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me so that I may know, for there is no one prior to you to redeem it, and I come after you. So he said, I will redeem it. Huh. Then, Everything is fine now. He is willing to redeem because we're talking about land. Now listen to the humor here now. Then Boaz said, the day you acquired the field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead man, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. So this is why this tradition exists. Go on. At this the next of kin said, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So Maybe he was married, maybe there was something else. And so he gives permission now to Boaz because he is the next kin in line to redeem the memory of the dead person. Go on. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one took off the sandal and gave it to the other. This was the manner of attesting in Israel. Yeah, there was no lawyers, no signing anything. 50,000 copies, okay. <laughs> sandals, you give the sandals, go on. So when the next of kin said to Boaz, acquire it for yourself, he took off the sandal. Then Boaz, Boaz said to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and Malon. The two sons, Mahalon and Kilayun, yeah. Okay. It's okay. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Mahalon, to be my wife, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance, in order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred and from the gate of his native place. Today you are witnesses. And all the people who were 
at the gate along with the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. By the way, until today, on the evening of a marriage, I walk into, as a rabbi, I walk into the room to sign the ketubah, the marriage contract, and this is the language I turn to the bride and say, may you be like Rachel and Leah. So some of those sentences from biblical time are in our ritualistic celebration. Well, Go on. They're also in a song from the musical Hamilton. 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 Yeah, 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 of course. Okay. He had seven daughters, for God's sake. Whatever. <laughs> the song was sung at the wedding. Yeah. By the parents. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. We, we, have some, uh, like <laughs> <laughs> we have some Jewish parents that don't like to sing. So the rabbi ends up saying it. Go on. Okay. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you produce children in... Ephrata and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And through the children that the Lord will give you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez, where, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Okay, what's going on here? Do you know the story of Tamar and Judah? So Judah had two sons, the same story again. Uh, both of them die, and there is the widow of, the, uh, of one of the sons by the name of Tamar. And so what is the responsibility of Judah now, the father of those two children? To take her, to take her as, a as a wife. So it's not only the re responsibility, I mean, there was no another son. They died the same. So the story is about Judah. So uh, Judah, of course, uh, forget about his responsibility. And uh, she is so smart. The women in the Bible are smarter than all the men in the Bible. <laughs> Similar to what we have now. Sorry. But uh, OK, sorry, men. But so she, uh, she decides to uh, trap him. How is she trapping him? She puts clothes like a harlot. And he, uh, she stays uh, in the middle of the road. And Judah needed to uh, whatever. And uh, he goes in and uh, sleeps with her. And uh, she says, uh, are you going to come back when the child is born? Uh, I need something, as a, uh, something of yours to keep as a, uh, what am I looking for? So he gives her the staff and the seal. This is Judah, uh, the two most important objects that he carries. The seal and the staff. And he forgets about this. And then someone tells him that uh, there is a, a woman uh, that is pregnant. And uh, he remembers that maybe uh, he needs to redeem, finish the act, and take her as a wife. And she comes to him, and she pretends he cannot recognize her. She puts all kind of masquerade, and, you know. Uh, and, uh, and she shows him the two items, and she shows this to also the judges at the gate, and he apologizes, he asks forgiveness, and he marries her. So similar kind of a story about the role of women, like Ruth, like Naomi, like Tamar, like other women that uh, had extremely strong prophetic uh, uh, ability. Okay, go on. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, Son. Isn't it nice when they came together? <laughs> what a polite word. They don't like it in the Apocrypha. Go on. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne them. Wow. A relationship between a daughter and a mother-in-law. Awesome. I'm sure you have many stories similar to that. <laughs> Not really, but so beautiful. Go on. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. Wow. Not to Ruth, to Naomi. 
Look at how it's viewed. How beautiful. Go on. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Yeah, that's how it goes. So Obed means uh, the servant, the servant of God. And he was the father of Jesse, Ishai, Jesse from the story of David. And then he was the father of David. Go on. Now these are the descendants of Perez. And now in case you didn't see the lineage, we're going to repeat it again. Go on. Uh, Perez became the father of Hezron, Hezron of Ram, Ram of Aminadab, Aminadab, Aminadab of Nashon, Nashon, Nashon of Salmon, 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 Salmon of Boaz, Boaz of Obed, Obed of Jesse, and Jesse of David. Yeah, so this is the lineage how we got to King David. And again, a Moabite woman is responsible for the appearance of King David. This is such a chutzpah to write in the Torah. And we know, we know what? That there was a political reason why this was written this way. To be able to accept the Moabites as legitimate, after the way we describe how they were conceived, the Moabites and the Ammonites, it's, it's a great courage on the part of the writer. There's a meaning there. OK. Uh, look now, take the other uh, material. And now we're going to go through Midrashic explanation of some of this material. So it says uh, Ruth and Naomi on the top, and so 48. Who would like to read 48? I'm sorry about the print, a little bit smaller. So they did. So they too went, and it came to pass, and they were come to Bethlehem. Okay, so uh, quotation from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 19. That's how all Midrashim starts with the quotation. Go on. Oh my God, that's an item that we didn't know. So the same day that they came back from Moab to Israel, the wife of Boaz died. Huge funeral. Go on. Just then Ruth came with Naomi as Boaz's wife was taken out, and Naomi came in. And all the city was disturbed concerning them. And the women said, Is this Naomi, the one whose appearance used to be so comely, so attractive? <laughs> Mara, or the bitter one, uh, just describes you. She goes back home, uh, and she doesn't look the same. She went through suffering, through pain, not only the death of the two sons, but also her husband. And uh, she comes back with two women, with one woman that she now needs to take care of. So this is a little bit about the Mara, the bitterness. And the, and the women. Uh, you know, they're sitting in coffee houses and talk about her. They just saw her coming in. Wow. Uh, but it's more than that. It's, it's why is she like this? What did she do? There is a little bit of what's wrong in her relationship to God that she got to this level of suffering and, and unhappiness. It's the God. Why would God uh, kill her sons and husband? What's wrong in that action? And so definitely tradition suggests that their migration to another country, not trusting God, why, why don't you stay where you're supposed to stay? Uh, is this showing lack of belief on the part of Naomi, that she and the part of the family going to another place to, and not trusting God? So this is part of the problem in the relationship with the women in the city. Go on, 49, another one. Yes. Then said Boaz, whose damsel is this? Did he not recognize her? Yes, but noticing how sweet she was and how demure in her conduct, he was moved to inquire about her. All the other women bent down to gather ears of corn, while she sat down to gather them. 
why is it so important that she sat down? What happened? What? Beautiful. Exactly. All of them were picking up the corns how? Bending down. Okay. And we know there were men and women working on the fields. Go on. All the other women hitched up their skirts while she kept hers down. All the other women bantered with the reapers while she was reserved. She sat apart from the reapers, not in their midst. All the other women gathered from between the sheaves while she gathered only what was already abandoned. Two sheaves, not three. Wow. So what are you learning about Ruth, how she presented here? This Moabite knew more about modesty and how to behave than some of the Israelite women doing the same in the field. So again, elevating Ruth, actually trying to understand why she is the one that will be connected to David. I mean, they have to build her up, and you build up those characters in the Midrashic literature. So the, the Torah is so concise and so stingy in words that the Midrash allows for the development of the characters to a level that you really adore them. That's the brilliance of Jewish text. Those rabbis, those rabbis were sitting around the table. How do we do a cosmetic repair with Ruth? Why would they buy this? What, what, what do we need to do? So they, they work. I mean, this is why, you know, think about the rabbis as cosmetic surgery. <laughs> Look at what they had to work, for example, very hard on David. Why King David was so problematic for the rabbis? Come on. Well, he was slandered. Absolutely. So they made him into the writer of the Psalms. He wrote all 150 psalms. Are you kidding? <laughs> there are some psalms that were written very late that he was not even alive. There's a psalm about on the rivers of Babylon, which means that this psalm was written when they were in exile. That's years after David was dead already. So that's what you do with David. You, uh, with David, you do something else. You mention Satan. Satan is a... Satan is a wonderful character. Satan in Judaism is just an angel that is a trickster. And then, of course, look what we did with Satan later. Oh, my God. He was just an angel that gets orders from God to entertain God a little bit. God cannot survive without an angel that is a trickster. That's why Job doesn't know what's going on. Chapter 1 and 2 in Job bring the Satan in because without the framework of chapter 1 and 2, you don't understand what the book of Job is all about. So originally, the book of Job did not have chapter 1 and 2. They were built later, you know, to create the tension. And so, uh, this is Ruth, building Ruth. Go to the next one. Anyone? 50, please. Then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my lord, though I be not as one of thy handmaidens. So she talks to Boaz. She has also the courage to talk to this man that owns the fields. Go on. Boaz replied, God forbid, you are not as one of the handmaidens, but as one of the matriarchs. Oh, beautiful. So this is a play with Hebrew. So you see the same, uh, you see in brackets, Amot is maids, Imaot, Ima in Hebrew is mothers, matriarchs. You are not part of this crew. You are part, Boaz recognizes already what will happen from that woman, from Ruth. He calls her a matriarch. Okay, next one. 51. Anyone? Rabbi Yohanan said, why was she called Ruth, the one who fills the overflowing? Because she was, such was her merit that from her was to issue David, who filled the overflowing, Ruth, the holy one with songs and hymns. Ruach. Ruach, Ruth, some kind of the same uh, spirit, the spirit. Uh, next one, 52. Rabbi Zahara said, the scroll of Ruth tells us nothing of the laws of cleanness or uncleanness of what is prohibited or what is permitted. 
Why then was it written? What a good question. This is part of the rabbis that were sitting in that committee around the table trying to figure out why is the book needs to be part of the canon. To teach you. Wait, wait, so what, what? There's nothing about cleanness on uncleanness, kosher or not kosher. There are no serious issues of uh, behavior. Okay, now comes the answer. Why was it written? To teach you how great is the reward of those who do deeds of kindness. That's it. That's why the book is in. It's, so the story of Ruth and Boaz, it's about a story about kindness and the merit that comes from doing kindness. I mean, to have a child that will be the father and the grandfather of King David, wow. How many of you would like to have a child that will be the Messiah? <laughs> None of you. We are Jewish, so we can't have one, right? What do you mean? Don't we have to be Jewish to have Messiah? I mean, don't just Isn't there a Messiah, Messiah in Christianity? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I'm, I'm suggesting... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, now we're going deeper into theology. Well, <laughs> the, it's, 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 the book is there just for the simplicity of the kindness and the merit. I mean, don't look for kosher, not kosher, not all the books. I mean, it's not about that because the rabbis were already dealing, uh, especially after the destruction of the temple, how to keep those Jews Jews. So they were dealing with, I mean, so the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of this is part of the conversation. But this book was included just because of the kindness, to teach kindness. And, that's, and I think this is the message, uh, I think. Uh, we need to have those kind of books also, books of how to behave, how to treat each other. Uh, that's the greatness of scriptures, both Christian, Jewish, Muslim. I mean, it's, it's, that's what they're trying to teach us, not always about what's clean and what's not clean. OK, next one. Next one, let's do. Uh, uh, 437 on the top of the next column. When Rabbi Samuel Bar Judah's daughter died, the sages said to Ula, Let us go in and console him. But he answered them, What have I to do with the Babylonians' manner of consolation? Okay, remember now, when Jews were in exile, there are different traditions being developed in Babylonia. We have the Babylonian Talmud and we have the Palestinian Talmud. So two amazing works of trying to deal with life after the destruction of the temple, written in two different places. So this rabbi says, why am I going to uh, go there to console? That's how the Babylonian Jews do it. Continue. Which is almost blasphemy. For they say, what can one do against God? Which implies that were it possible to do anything, they would have done it. Wow. They were doubting the power of God at some of their writings, and I don't want to go there because this kind of a notion is blasphemy. Go on. He therefore went alone to Rabbi Samuel and said to him, Scripture says, And the Lord said unto me, Be not at enmity with Moab, neither contend with them in battle. Wow. So in the book of Deuteronomy, there is a line about a war, and it says there, that uh, the Lord said, uh, be careful with the way you're dealing with the Moabites. Go on. Now there is, there is the question. Would it have entered Moses' mind to wage war against Moab without God's express permission? So that God had to say explicitly, do not contend with Moab. No, but reasoning off. A priori. Moses said, concerning the Midianites, who came only to assist the Moabites, the Torah has commanded, vex the Midianites and smite them. Numbers 25:17. Therefore, all the more should the Moabites themselves be vexed. But the Holy One said to Moses, the idea that entered your mind is not what entered mine. I love this. Don't you love this conversation between God and Moses? Are you crazy? <laughs> Basically, he says to him, are you crazy? Uh, look how careful God is when it comes to the Moabites. The Midianites, he said what? Vax them. Fight them. The Moabites, already from the beginning, there was a clue 
that the Moabites are going to be treated differently. And that gives legitimization to the appearance of Ruth and to have a special book written about a Moabite woman. Go on. But the Holy One said to Moses, the idea that entered your mind is not what entered mine. There are two good doves I must bring forth from these two nations, Ruth the Moabite and Naamah the Ammonite. Now, Go on. Now may not the matter be argued off authority. If for the sake of two good doves, who were to descend from Moab and Ammon, the Holy One showed pity to these two great nations, so that they were not destroyed. Does it not follow all the more that if my master, Rabbi Ayas, daughter, had been fit and worthy to have good, uh, goodly issue, she would not have died, but would have remained alive? Yeah. So, I mean, here is again the discussion that took place in the table. Uh, they knew already that Lot's daughter conceived those two nations in such a discra disgraceful way, manner, incest. So they are discussing again, why would we put the Book of Ruth in the Bible? So they find proof text. Uh, God is not thinking the same way Moses is thinking. God wanted to save some remnants from those two nations because there is goodness that can appear even among those nations that were conceived maybe in illegitimate way. Uh, it's interesting how God gets involved in, in the text. Uh, God provides help to the committee to make sure the books are in. Can you imagine if they decided that the book is out? We will never know what. What are we going to miss if the book was not in the Bible? No, no, I'm saying, if this book was not in the Bible, what would be our shortcoming? Kindness. What? Kindness. Kindness. The ability of people from the whole issue of interfaith marriage, the whole issue of how we need to, uh, why would we do tri-faith initiative if we didn't have the book? I mean, after all, we are welcoming people from completely different ways of life. So the book is there to teach not about holy, not holy, clean, not clean, to teach how one behaves. Look at how she behaved with her mother-in-law. I will go wherever you go. I will die. I mean, completely an action that was not imagined when the piece about Lot and the daughters was written. So the rabbis gave it a kosher stamp. It's in. Uh, uh, too bad no one recorded those conversations. It'll be nice to have a video of how every book in the Bible was in or out. That's why you have the Apocrypha. And I'll show you in a second how that works. Uh, 412. Anyone? Please. So they just, the, the sages also decided the order of the Jewish Bible, of Hebrew scriptures. Go on. The order of the writings is Ruth and the Book of Psalms and Job and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalm of Psalms and Lamentations, Daniel and the Scroll of Esther, Ezra and Proverbs. Now they will argue who wrote what. <laughs> Go on. Balaam. Balaam was this prophet that wanted to curse the Israelites. Uh, 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 the one with the donkey. Okay. Uh, so Moses wrote not, uh, that, that. So he wrote his own book and Job. So Moses was the one that wrote the book of Job. Go on. Okay. Why the last eight verses of the fifth book, the Deuteronomy. Because what's the story there? Is that where Moses died? Yeah. Moses cannot write his own death. 
So Joshua wrote those eight verses that, just in case you doubt uh, who wrote them, go on. I'm sure none of you read Chronicles. It's one of the most, the first and second are boring. They're just gene uh, names, genealogy. David wrote what book? Book of Psalms, including in it the work of ten elders, Adam, Melchizedek, Korach was the guy that rebelled against Moses. So Moses wrote the verses about Korach. But is all this true? No. <laughs> I, I, wish, I wish we, we actually knew who wrote what. But this gives permission for what? What is the revelation here? That it all hangs together. And that those are human products. I mean, this is the permission to maybe say, uh, maybe it's not really divine revelation, everything. And so maybe you should take it not only as the word of God, but also as something that has other lessons to learn from. And then the last one is uh, 29. Dinners. So that's the argument from the book of Ruth. You only are allowed to leave the land of Israel when two measures of wheat cost a million dollars. Uh, there is one of the commandments is thou shall never go to Egypt. So 613 commandments, one of them tells us that we should never go to Egypt. That's why I have never visited Egypt. No, not really. I don't want to go there. <laughs> no, but, but, but Egypt, Egypt in the Jewish psychic is the worst place that we Jews have been. In a way, without going to Egypt, I will be not standing, sitting here and teaching. I mean, Egypt is about darkness, about evil, about all the, all the bad things that happen. Why? <laughs> it's very important for the writers of the New Testament to parallel Jesus like Moses. Oh, okay. And, and not, not like uh, Moses and Abraham. Yeah, that's a hopeful story too. Well, they also took Jesus there to run away. I mean, if, Escaped. If Egypt is the one place you don't go, then you won't follow him. Okay. <laughs> I don't think they ever thought about following him there. Yeah. Uh, but it's nice. Uh, by the way, uh, isn't there also a why why the why the family of Jesus needs to be at Bethlehem? I mean, Jesus from Nazareth. Why why suddenly he needs to appear in Bethlehem? Yeah, because of the book of Ruth. So the writing of that story of Jesus in Bethlehem comes as a need to connect between Jesus and David and Ruth. Because he was Jesus from Nazareth. So there's, there's a story, I mean, there was a taxations and the family moved. Yeah, why there and not to another place? 
It's, it's all calculated. It's brilliant, brilliant writing of putting all those pieces together. I am sure the people who wrote the New Testament had in front of them the Old Testament. And they worked it very well. Makes sense. I think it's fantastic. All documents are political, guys. It's all about politics. OK. That doesn't diminish my faith or my desire to do good things. So even if I call it a human product, it doesn't change anything. That's why I don't st understand the discussion about creationism versus evolution. This is what we need to talk about. Now we need to talk about it. We have a president that doesn't believe in any of this. OK, let's continue. So this is not even about how much it costs. Even if there's no if there's no wheat, it doesn't matter what a price, you cannot leave the land. Go on. But if one does, does find wheat for purchase, then even if one sale costs as much as four dinars, one may not leave. Wow. So this one has a different uh, uh, you never leave. Even if it's so expensive, you never leave. You'll find a way to overcome. I mean this this issue of God and the Holy Land. When you leave, what are, what, are, what are the difficulties when you leave? What happens? You assimilate. You forget about the way you came from. Uh, actually, uh, exile in Judaism, and I can, <laughs> I can, I can teach exile in Judaism. Uh, it's, it's, it's a grave sin. So I live now in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm in exile. Judaism had to create God is in every place because there was no choice. When you are pushed away after the destruction of the Second Temple to another place, you cannot have a philosophy and theology that what? The God, God is not with you. So God becomes, the Jewish God becomes a whole new theological understanding. God is with us even in exile. We all always know that we are in exile. The only place to, to be, really, is the Holy Land. And even in the Holy Land, if you live in Tel Aviv, you're in exile. You're supposed to live in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, you, next to the temple, that was, and you need to build a temple. I mean, so we have, so we live with a trauma, all of us, all Jews, all Jews that are conscience. That, I mean, if we live away from the land of Israel, uh, something is not really fixed. Nothing is, not everything is complete. So we Jews don't like to use the word exile, so we call it diaspora. Diaspora sounds a little bit softer. Isn't it nice? Diaspora. Exile. By the way, we would not be where we are without the gifts that we receive as a result of living in exile. I mean, on one hand, we need to be light to the nations, how can I be light to the nations if I am preoccupied with parochial understanding of where I am? So the, this is part of the, of the struggle. Part of the struggle. How are you treated then as someone from, who lives in exile who goes back to Israel? What, is there any difference with the way that you are? Yeah, they don't like. I mean, they, so when are you moving back? <laughs> it's always when are you moving back? I don't want to move back. Uh, actually, I can be a Jew living in Israel in exile. I don't know if you heard what happened yesterday with the Israeli government. The Israeli government had an option to allow for mixed praying next to the wall, and they canceled it because of the pressure of the Orthodox parties. So I can be, I, I will be a liberal Jew in Israel in exile, in my own land. Also, they only accept Orthodox conversions now. So. I, I, I converted people in Omaha, Nebraska. None of them is considered a Jew by the authorities, the Orthodox authorities in Israel. So one, one can also be in exile from God. It doesn't matter where you live. 
Uh, I think actually uh, exile is, is good. Being, living in a, in a theology where you are not really comfortable because you're not really reaching the ultimate allows for development of everything we have been studying. I think exile, for the person that takes it seriously, means more committed, more commitment to the religion that you are. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's a lot harder to be a liberal, reformed Jew than orthodox Jew. Because with orthodoxy, you have rules and laws, and you have the book, and you do the book, and this is it. Uh, although sometimes it's hard to find matzah in small little towns around America. They don't have matzah. So uh, I, I, th I think as a reformed, liberal, conservative Jew, you need to think every day of how you're going to bring Judaism into, into your life. I think, I think for this church, how to be a Christian requires more work than for someone who is Catholic, for example. I mean, so the question is, what do you do? What are the works? How do you become more religious when you selected a different way of understanding the relationship between you and Jesus? It's a question that we need to ask ourselves. I think it's hard to be Christian. <laughs> okay, uh, you guys okay? Okay. Uh, Yeah, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I understand, I, I understand what the Catholics want. I understand this. Catholics are like Orthodox Jews in a way. That's why, that's why they don't like you, and that's why Orthodox Jews don't like me. It's okay. It allows for more creativity, more understanding, more struggle. I, I actually love when I struggle with God. I think God loves that too. We provide some entertainment for God. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Machlon and Kilayon. Yeah, that was the problem. That's why they die in the beginning of the book. The beginning of the book, they leave and they die immediately. Those were leaders of the community and they left. How come they didn't stay there in time of drought to help the community? So it wasn't just leaving, leaving their leadership, their positions. Instead of staying in the town and helping everyone to overcome the drought, they left. That's why they died. Okay, so this is uh, a little bit of how the rabbis view the Book of Ruth and the additions of what they needed to teach us through the Book of Ruth. And now comes the story of the marriage of Ruth. This is again from the Apocrypha. It's the next page. And uh, basically most of the material is, uh, is the, similar to the Book of Ruth. So it's interesting. Uh, is this a page that was originally on the table and they decided to remove it? Uh, was it written by a Jew or maybe a non-Jew? So part of the debates with the Apocrypha is that you don't know exactly who wrote it. Uh, and maybe some of the uh, ideological uh, stuff in it doesn't work with the complete lesson of what the rabbis wanted to do. But, yeah. Uh, you, you didn't buy Apocrypha. You didn't buy all the Apocrypha. I think you got the short version. Uh, can, can you buy, uh, you can buy New Testament only of the important <laughs> testimonies. Now, what I'm saying is, I think, 
I, I, I bring it next time. No. I would love to see. It. I want you to know we're in different countries. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> I will, I'll, I'll bring the, uh, I don't have it with me now, but I'll bring you the information how to get it. Three huge thousands of pages. You want to have three volumes of thousands of pages? But you know what? That's how you're going to live till 120. So if you buy this, God will extend your life until you're done, until you're done with reading all the volumes. Uh, yeah, so I think you got something abbreviated, just a story about what the apocrypha, yeah. How much? Ten bucks? <laughs> Ten bucks will not buy the apocrypha. Okay. Uh, but who would like to read the beginning? Just the beginning. Please. No, 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 where are you? I'm in the marriage of Ruth. Yeah. Not many days later, there. Yeah. Boaz came, and once the barley had been delivered. Oh, so what's missing? In this in this book of marriage, all the story of how she got the Moabite, how the drought, all this is not there. All their relationship with uh, Naomi is not there. We don't know anything about the sons and what happened to Elimelech, the husband of. So this is what the book is. So it's one page, the marriage of Boaz, without all the information that we glean from the book of Ruth. Go on. And once the barley had been literally slept on the threshing floor, when she found out about this, Naomi devised a plan to have Ruth lie down beside him, for he would be kind toward him once he had intercourse with him. Oh my God! By the way, she does exactly the same in the book of Ruth, but it's not so brutal, coarse, yeah. Uh, there she explains that he's a king, and this is the right way, and he will see you there. Uh, but in the book of Ruth, there's still the lifting of his dress. So uh, <laughs> there's no conversation about underwear there. <laughs> Uh, by the way, growing up in Israel, you go to regular secular schools and you read the book of Ruth. So I study Bible already in elementary school. And those are the chapters that we read under the table. So it was exciting. Uh, I mean, those kind of stories. King David and Bathsheba, the teacher never explained what really happened there. It doesn't matter. It was just a way of reading sex in Bible classes. Uh, continue, please. Yeah, I mean, she was, the rest of the story is exactly the same of what happens in the book of Ruth. Uh, he does exactly with the king, the same stuff, with the witnesses. Look at line 335, Boaz, therefore, uh, talking to the elders as a witness, directed the woman to approach the other man and he spit in his face. So here, there's a new tradition, not so much just about the shoe, but there's also the spitting in the face. So the person that has the right to marry Ruth spits in the face of Boaz, which is not in the book. So maybe there was a different tradition that was as relevant in those days. Go on. So then he married her, and a year later, he has a male child. Uh, Naomi nursed him in accordance to the Council of the Women, so that's additional. Uh, and the name Oved, the same name, uh, which means serves. Uh, and then of Oved, Jesse was born, so the same lineage is here. And then it ends up with the following. It was therefore necessary for me, isn't it interesting? This is the writer inserting himself. We don't know who it is, but he says, it was therefore necessary for me to relay these matters concerning Ruth being uh, desirous to show the power of God, how easy it is for him, for God, to promote anyone to the splendid dignity and success to which he elevates David sprung from such people. So the whole, this page, only one page, 
about the marriage of Boaz was there for what purpose? In the Apocrypha. Yeah, think about what kind of people David is coming from. Look at the love of Ruth to her mother-in-law and the relationship between Boaz. I mean, to be able to do all this stuff for this poor woman, uh, this, this can be, this by the way was made into a musical, the Book of Ruth was made into a musical. You can see how this can become a musical on Broadway. It was pretty boring. <laughs> but it's, it's a good story. The musical is awful. Uh, some of us rabbis need to suffer. We have to go see those kind of things. Yes. They are elevated so by God. It almost seemed like a put down because people before. No, no, but, but, but why, why would God elevate Ruth to this level of being the great grandmother of King David? I mean, yeah, even people that we sometimes despise and people that we call less fortunate, it's a phrase that I hate vehemently. I hate when I hear this word, less fortunate. We are judging people by calling them less fortunate. Who gives us permission to do that? And so even those miserable characters can be elevated to be able to produce the announcer of the Messiah. Wow. So the book of Ruth is about the simpleton. What do we do with the simpleton? How do we treat the simpleton? How do we treat those people on the other side of the track? This is a book about that. It's about Simple things. It's not about clean or not clean. It's about taking care of each other and looking at every person as created in the image of God. That's what the book is all about. And then it makes sense that this, this will lead to Jesus. It's also elevating. I mean, it's interesting to see what, I mean, I know what Christianity does with the book of Ruth because that's exactly what they do. I mean, how would Jesus know how to take care of those simple people that he meets and heals and redeems? And Where is this coming from? It's coming from having a great-grandmother, Ruth the Moabite, that already showed this kind of care and compassion. And that's how the book has, has to be read by Christians. And it's there. It's in the theology. Read the introduction uh, in, in Christian writings to the Book of Ruth. I mean, that's exactly what it is. Jesus did not come from a lineage of royalty. He came from simple people, which is a lesson to all of us. Next, uh, uh, I'll ask uh, the doctor to please uh, suggest now what we'll do next Monday from the conversation we had. Yeah, uh, the, the series, the worship series is moving into the New Testament and some of the women in that tradition. And it includes the um, Syrophoenician woman who, um, who has a daughter who needs to be healed and asks Jesus to heal her. And he says, why should I give gifts to non-Israel people, right? And she says, even the dogs get crumbs from the table. Um, then the, the Samaritan woman at the well, and then uh, Mary Magdalene. Those are the three that are coming next. And so uh, when we talk about those women in that tradition, what we're talking about is um, the kind of, uh, what do we call it? It's not a collaboration. It's a composition. Composition. Composite. A composite of all the other women in the rest of the tradition. And it's really a characterization, right, um, that says something about kindness, that says something about how we behave with one another and who, who God is and how God relates to God's people, right? So that's the stuff we're going to be talking about is the, the characteristics of some of these women. Even though they didn't come specifically out of the Hebrew tradition, 
they did come from the Hebrew tradition because that is our heritage. Yes? So, yes. And so what I will do for next Monday is uh, bring some of those characters in the Jewish Bible and how out of them those women uh, were created. Those, those pieces are put together. Because, uh, for example, uh, we talked about the well. What's the, wo what's the role of the well in Christian writings? <coughs> Why, why is the well so important? And so we have a lot of well stories in uh, the Jewish Bible, but also we have women, uh, for example, uh, Joshua. How was Joshua able to conquer Jericho? There was a harlot there, a woman that slept with people. I mean, what do you do with those characters, uh, simple, uh, people that you will dismiss from being a fabric of a society. What is the role of those people in the Jewish Bible and how those roles continue to play a lesson in the New Testament? Right. So and we'll see where we go. We are meeting on the third. Yes. We're meeting next, uh, yeah, next Monday. And that'll be the last time we meet for this particular series, but Nancy Bisak has suggested that perhaps um, if you, if this is a good time for you and you'd like to continue coming, even if it's not the rabbi class, we do have an all church read that we're doing right now with Richard Rohr's book called The Divine Dance. Mm -hmm. And from all the groups that I know that are reading that and studying it, it is a challenge and it is much better to have a group to read that with so that you can struggle together with it and hear different perspectives. You can so dance alone. You can, <laughs> the whole point is the Trinity, you need at least three. So, uh, um, so uh, Nancy is offering to, to be the facilitator for that group. If you'd like to continue coming and have discussions about the Divine Dance, we have discussion sheets, we have, um, we have video of Richard Rohr talking to a bunch of people and doing um, uh, commentary on his own stuff. Uh, we have additional chapters from Mike Morell, who's going to be one of our uh, speakers for Center for Faith Studies, all oh, that kind of great. stuff is happening. So we have resources galore if you want to actually get into reading this book so you're ready for when Mike comes here in September. So if you want to come, then talk to Nancy and um, make sure that uh, we know approximately how many people to expect and that it's, it's worth Nancy's time to come here and facilitate it if you all be here. Now it's summertime and people will come and go but if you'd like to at least be a part of some of the discussion, please let her know that. And we'll make sure you have resources for all that. Is that and, good? And we're going to meet uh, uh, this summer and start planning the adult learning for next year. September 10th starts the beginning of uh, what uh, Eric has developed with San Francisco Theological Seminary called the Living Lectionary. And it's based on our Phoenix affirmations, yes? So um, all of the Presbyterians are now using our stuff. How's, how's that? Um, so we're rethinking how we um, develop that stuff and how we um, use a different lens to come at it this time around. We've done Phoenix Affirmations over and over again, but it's one of those things that you just keep doing because you reinterpret all of life with it, right? So. Um, the Living Lectionary is what we're going to be working with, and the rabbi has agreed to work with us on those uh, lectionary texts so that we can do more of this kind of uh, text study even before we get to it on the Sunday morning. And also we have talked about the role of the imam. Right. Uh, uh, you know, we need to sit down and talk and... and yeah, and, and see what his schedule and if is. Ma and if Monday, Monday morning seems to be great. So... Uh, There's well, nothing yeah. else to do in this town on Monday morning. <laughs> this yeah. is the place to be. Thank you very much. See you next week.